Hi guys, it's Hannah Hamilton again here with the Rural Health Network Nutrition Class Series. Um, and today we're continuing on with our mom and baby series. And we will be talking about breastfeeding mostly today and a little bit on general postpartum nutrition. Um, so thanks for joining us. Oh, uh, yeah, if you don't know me, Hannah Hamilton, I'm a registered dietitian. I'm also a certified specialist in pediatrics and a recently a certified lactation counselor. So um, this is, uh, hopefully you will enjoy this presentation. All right, a little bit of an introduction with breastfeeding. Um, so breastfeeding is the optimal or best choice for feeding a baby. Breastfeeding can be exclusive, which means only breast milk for the first six months of life. So nothing else, just breast milk or it can be supplemented with formula. Um, exclusive breastfeeding is recommended until six months with continued breastfeeding till about two years by the World Health Organization and the Academy of Pediatrics. And so what I mean by waiting until six months is around six months, we usually introduce foods at that time. So it's no longer ex considered exclusive breastfeeding because you are introducing something else besides breast milk, um, but it is recommended to con continue just breastfeeding until again, two years and beyond. Women can provide breast milk by a couple different ways. So they're able to latch the baby like you see in this photo here and provide the breast milk um, by latching or um, some moms you like to use a pump and pump their milk and provide the breast milk through a bottle or a lot of moms like to do some of both. Um, there's definitely some benefits if you um, choose to do a little bit of both because if you have a partner that would like to feed the baby, that's a great option to provide some pump milk so they can do that in the bottle as well. And almost all women can breastfeed with the proper education and support. There's very few cases where breastfeeding is um, contraindicated, but uh, most of the time, most women can breastfeed. And here is some statistics about breastfeeding in the United States. So the most recent numbers we have are from 2018. Um, in 2018, 83.9% of all infants born in the United States were breastfeeding at some point. About 56.7% were breastfeeding some for six months. So that usually is a combination of formula and breastfeeding. About 35% were breastfeeding some for one year. Again, that could be a combination of the breastfeeding and formula. And then here we have some data on exclusively breastfeeding, which means no formula at all. About 46.3% were doing just breast milk for the first three months and about 25.8% were doing just breast milk for six months, which again is the recommendation by the World Health Organization and the Academy of Pediatrics. And then below here, we have some healthy people goals, which come out in the United States to help us reach certain goals to help make our country more healthy. And we have for 2030, we have a goal to increase exclusive breastfeeding rates through six months by 42% and for one year to 54.1%. So we have a little bit of work to do. So um, we are striving to get that up a little bit and we will talk about why we wanna get that up in the next couple slides. And then also, if you wanna look over here to the right on this great picture that I have, it does show which states have the highest rates of breastfeeding. It looks like Oregon and Vermont have some of the highest rates. And unfortunately, Florida is not the best um, when it comes to breastfeeding. We're about 40 to less than 50% for breastfeeding infants in the United States. So we are trying to get our numbers up for our state as well. <clears throat> so why is breast milk or breastfeeding best for the baby? So when an infant is breastfed, it really is an investment in their health. There is so much research and evidence that shows that breastfeeding your baby provides so many great benefits um, for that baby for the rest of their life. It really is, a lot of people like to call it the first immunization for the baby because it is so protective on so many things. Here's just some of the benefits of breastfeeding. It includes reduced risk of asthma, obesity, type one diabetes, severe lower respiratory disease, ear infections, sudden infant death syndrome, GI issues such as diarrhea and vomiting, necrotizing intercolitis or neck, which is very common or more common in premature babies, just less general illness overall, higher IQ, increased bonding, immunities from mother passed to babies. And I just want to highlight this does include COVID antibodies, which is really interesting. Some new research has come out to show that the mom does pass those antibodies to the baby, which is great. 
Um, and then formula feeding increases the risks, unfortunately, of all the above diseases or issues we just discussed. So um, that's some of the reasons why we want to increase our breastfeeding rates is because of the benefits for the baby. <clears throat> this is a great picture I like to use when I kind of compare the difference between breast milk and formula. As you can see, there's so many things that breast milk contains that formula just will never contain, unfortunately. Um, as much as we try to produce or reproduce the breast milk uh, benefits, it's just, it's virtually impossible. Um, breast milk has growth factors and certain enzymes that help them break down different things. They have anti-parasites, anti-allergies, antiviruses, hormones, antibodies. Uh, the list goes on and on what, what breast milk really does have in comparison to formula. So breast milk has more of the essentials that babies need to thrive instead of just simply survive. Um, like I said, it has those antibodies, hormones, antivirus, lots of different things that unfortunately just formula just doesn't give or provide the baby. <clears throat> so why do we want babies to just be exclusively breastfed? Um, but which meaning no formula at all. Um, when any amount of formula is introduced, unfortunately, it can really affect the breastfeeding relationship uh, it, if you start supplementing with formula and providing a bottle of formula instead of a, providing a bottle of breast milk or breastfeeding the baby, it tells your body to stop producing as much breast milk. So the body really runs on if you're breastfeeding or if you're pumping, it's telling the body to continue producing the milk. Um, if you start introducing more formula bottles in place of the breastfeeding, it will tell your body to stop producing as much milk. So even one bottle of formula can really start to decrease your supply. Um, which can be, you know, not a great feeling when you feel like you're not getting enough for the baby. Um, the breast milk shapes the gut microbiota composition of infants by providing nutrients for beneficial bacteria growth. Infants who receive any amount of formula can disrupt this vital growth and cause significant shifts, which can lead to increased risk of illness and other issues. So the very first six months of life, especially the very, you know, couple months, um, that breast milk really provides starts building the, the infant's immunity system. And once you start introducing that formula, it completely can change your gut microbiota, which is a big part of your immune system. Um, even just a little bit of formula can do this. It's pretty amazing. They've done a lot of research on this and, and taken the, you know, the micro, the bacteria in an infant with just breast milk, an infant with breast milk and formula, and then an infant with just formula. And the, the microbiota of the infant with breast milk and formula looks just like the, unfortunately, the baby would just, was just fed formula. So. That really shows us that any amount of formula can be disruptive to this microbiota composition. Um, so another reason why we try to just do breast milk um, for that very sick first six months of life. <clears throat> um, also, this important gut microbiota that is formed when the breast milk only is provided really shapes the infant's immune development, like we just talked about, and elk also can help with allergy prevention later in life as well. <clears throat> okay, so not only is the baby getting benefits when they are breastfeeding, the mother is also receiving some really great benefits too. Um, it can help lower the mother's risk of high blood pressure, type 2 diabetes, ovarian cancer, and breast cancer. Um, one of the really cool studies that I saw is if a mom does get gestational diabetes, which we talked about in our last class, they do have an increased risk of about 25% of getting diabetes after they give birth. But if the mom does breastfeed after the mom gives birth, it actually takes away that risk, that 25% increase of risk of having type 2 diabetes. They did a couple of studies on it. It was really amazing um, how it kind of reversed that risk that you have when you get gestational diabetes if you choose to breastfeed. So pretty cool. Breastfeeding can also burn a lot of calories, sometimes up to 500 calories a day. So this can obviously really help get back to that uh, pre-pregnancy weight. Um, so that's a great, great benefit of breastfeeding right there. You pretty much are doing a one hour long high intensity interval training session by just breastfeeding the baby. <clears throat> breastfeeding infants are also less likely to get sick, like we mentioned. So the family will not have to take off so much of work and school, um, which can be really great. And obviously there's increased bonding with the infant. Um, mothers that have breastfed, you know, really talk about that bonding that they get with the infant. Um, that, you know, unfortunately, a bottle fed baby, they don't feel like that same bonding was there. So it's a great bonding as well. Okay, 
So the first hour of life, this is a really important time to establish breastfeeding. And this is the very first hour that the baby is born. Um, so breastfeeding the infant within the first hour of life is crucial for breastfeeding success. Babies who breastfed within that first hour tend to breastfeed for longer periods of time and increases the chances for exclusive breastfeeding. So formula would not be needed. If mother is unable to latch the infant within the first hour, for some reason, the baby was taken away from the mom or had to go somewhere else, um, the mother should be provided guidance on at least expressing her breast milk, okay? Um, skin to skin contact within the first hour of life promotes this first breastfeed, helps regulate newborn's body temperature, and exposes baby to beneficial bacteria from their mother's skin. Another really cool um, thing with skin to skin. <clears throat> like I said, if you're um, if you're unable to breastfeed that baby within the first hour, um, like I said, definitely try to express your breast milk or ask for help on how to do that. There's lots of lactation counselors at the hospital um, that can be really helpful. And then also doing that skin to skin. Um, if mother is not able to do skin to skin, the father can also do skin to skin and get the same um, regulating body temperature benefits, which is really cool. <clears throat> Some other ways to increase your breastfeeding success when you're at the hospital that I wanted to talk about. Again, that skin to skin. <clears throat> After a few hours, the baby will be very sleepy. So really taking advantage of this first hour when they're more awake can be really helpful on um, getting that first breastfeed. And skin to skin is possible with a C-section. Um, a lot of times, you know, though they can still be stitching mom up and the baby can be brought onto the mother's chest while all that is going on. So again, just discussing with your healthcare team, this is what you wanna do and make sure everybody knows that, including nurses, doctors, any other caretaker or healthcare provider that you'll be working with at the hospital. <clears throat> like I just said, discuss your breastfeeding goals with everyone involved in the hospital and ask them to not provide formula without your consent. Ask to see the hospital lactation counselor as soon as possible. They're there, they're able to help you. A lot of times I recommend um, before the baby even comes to meet with the hospital lactation counselor so you guys get to know each other, you know, you feel comfortable working with, with her. Um, once the baby gets there, it can be a really great time to uh, establish some sort of relationship with her. When the baby does come, try to avoid bottles and pacifiers. <clears throat> Babies can be fed colostrum with a small cup, a spoon, or a syringe, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, ask the baby to be in the room with you. So the baby does not need to go to the nursery again, unless otherwise told the, you can ask the baby to be brought in and have being a bassinet by you, by the bed. This is a great way to, for you to breastfeed the baby when the baby's hungry. <clears throat> really try to limit your visitors. You will need lots of rest and baby will be breastfeeding a lot, about 10 or more times in 24 hours when the baby first comes. So you'll need a lot of time to be with the baby and to practice that breastfeeding. So. Having too many visitors can disrupt that, um, cause any issues with that. If your baby is born premature, and sometimes this happens because the baby is not able to latch because their mouth isn't formed fully, um, like we discussed earlier, express your milk and keep practicing when you do have a chance to try to breastfeed the baby. But definitely express your milk. That's gonna tell your body to continue to produce that milk. Um, just like you're breastfeeding the baby, you should be expressing your milk around the same amount of times. <clears throat> discuss birth control options. Sometimes I hear moms getting birth control shots in the hospital after birth. Um, sometimes this can affect your milk supply. So again, discuss your birth control options with your provider and let them know that you are breastfeeding so they're aware of that. And this is just a little overview about how milk is made. It's, it's very, it can get very complicated with all the different hormones, but we're gonna keep it simple today. Pretty much the baby suckles. It sends a signal to the body and the body makes milk. So it's pretty incredible. So again, that baby suckling or the pump working is again gonna tell your body to make that milk. So it's important to do that again, at least about 10 times in 24 hours when the baby first gets here. All right, successful latch. This is a really important tool to know how to successfully latch a baby because it's gonna make your breastfeeding um, journey a lot better. It's gonna increase your success for breastfeeding. Um, so having a successful latch is super, super important. Um, just wanna go overview on this. Um, before you start, you wanna start with the nose to the nipple. So the baby's nose should be rubbing up against the mom's nipples and this is gonna tell the baby to open its mouth. Also really important, 
the tummy, baby's tummy should be in towards mommy's tummy. You know, the baby should not be on its back when you're trying to breastfeed. You shouldn't be hunching over to get the um, your nipple into the baby's mouth. The baby's tummy should be against your tummy and the nose should be rubbing mom's nipple. Once the baby's mouth is open, make sure it's open really, really wide, about 145 degree angle. So that's gonna be pretty wide, baby opens its mouth. <clears throat> then the baby's chin is pushed against the breast. You wanna make sure that both of their lips are curled out on the breast. Um, that's a good sign that they're getting the full um, areola in the mouth. And then you also wanna make sure the head is slightly extended to aid in easier swallowing, okay? So all those are good indicators of successful latch and what you wanna to do to start that latch. And once the baby is latched, you, um, their chin should drop with a rhythmic suck and you can hear their swallowing. It sounds like a soft k. You do not hear any consistent clicking or smacking. It should be an asymmetrical latch, which means you don't want to be a perfect latch. It wants to be uh, more of the areola, which is the dark part of your nipple, should be near the baby's chin. And then when you are latched, you should feel a strong tug during the feeding, but there should not be any sharp pains. If you are having pains, you're most likely not having a good latch, and you want to break that latch and try again. Um, and when you do break a latch, you do not want to just pull the baby off. That can cause damage to the nipple or the areola. Um, you want to stick two fingers into the baby's mouth, and that should release the baby's mouth off your breast. Here's just a picture here about successful latch. Again, you see the nose to the nipple. It makes the baby open the mouth. Then the mom pushes the boob into the baby's mouth. And as you can see, the baby has a lot of the boob into the mouth, and there should be an asymmetrical latch. Here are some different positions with breastfeeding, lots of different positions. Um, you have the cradle position, which is the pretty much the, the basic position we were talking about with tummy to tummy. The baby's head and body are supported with your arms as you hold them tummy to tummy. Um, you can use a pillow underneath the baby to help hold the baby up, which can be helpful. They have breastfeeding pillows as well. Um, the next one is a cross cradle position. Hold the baby with the arm opposite of the chest or the breast, making sure not to put pressure against the baby's head. Um, this is an important thing when you do, you want to support the baby's neck, but you never want to put your hand on the back of the baby's head because that's going to make the baby pull the head back and that's not going to be a good breastfeeding position. The baby will probably pull off your breast. So again, you can support the neck, but don't, don't put your hand on the baby's head. Um, the football hold. So baby lays face facing your side with feet and legs tucked under your arm. <clears throat> the latching the sideline position. Um, this is if you're laying down. A lot of times mom like, moms like to do this, you know, during the night, laying on your side, have baby face to you, and again, tummy to tummy. Um, the semi-reclined position. So baby is supported by your body and baby's head is free to move. Mm -hmm. And then with multiple, here's a picture of a mom with multiple babies. Um, they're, both be, they're both breastfeeding at the same time. They can have the double cradle hold front hold, their sideline positions, everything pretty much times two. Okay, so how do we know if baby is getting enough? This is one of the concerns that breastfeeding moms have because they can't see what is going into the baby. So here are some signs that baby is getting enough and you know you have a good latch and the baby is getting plenty of milk from you. So when the baby is latched, again, you have that audible, that k and that visible, you can see the baby swallowing when the baby is latched. That's great. Ear wiggles can be a good sign that baby's getting enough. Uh, a strong pulling sensation at the breast. So again, not pain, but definitely a pulling sensation. The baby is getting milk out of you. Um, the breasts are softer after the feeding, and you may or may not feel let down, um, which is a, usually a stronger flow of milk. Sometimes you will, sometimes you won't. And then um, some also signs that baby is getting enough. Over the second and third day after birth, a minimum of two to three wet diapers and two poop diapers indicate baby is nursing effectively and getting enough. So I always tell moms what goes in must come out. So having enough, enough wet diapers and poop diapers is a sign that baby's getting plenty to eat. 
And then on day four and day five, that poop color becomes a pale yellow and should be about two or more times a day. And P should be a minimum of about four or five um, per day or more. So kind of like, you know, on day two, you're gonna be two and two. On day three, three and two. Um, so the P should be going up about every day um, once, you know, max about six diapers a day. A lot of times breastfeeding babies are a lot more than that. Some moms have it after every feeding. Um, as long as the, ba the poop is pale yellow, um, you know, not diarrhea, um, that's perfectly normal. <clears throat> so the rest of the month, baby should have at least two poops a day and around five to six peas or more in 24 hours. After six weeks, um, sometimes babies poop less often, which is totally normal. So it's no longer a good indicator of intake. But if baby is peeing enough and gaining weight and meeting developmental milestones, nothing to worry about. So you go see the doctor at your scheduled appointments, baby's gaining weight perfectly, baby's peeing, no issues with breastfeeding then. Baby is getting plenty to eat from you. I always like to talk about the size of the baby's tummy. Um, you know, a lot of times I hear moms, you know, providing lots of, sometimes formula, usually two, three ounces per feeding, sometimes even more in the beginning. Um, and a lot of times it's just not needed. And we really wanna try to prevent that overfeeding with the newborn baby. So. On day one, the stomach is the size of a large marble. Um, by day seven, it's the size of an egg. So again, that's not very, very big. And a typical newborn will eat 10 to 12 times because <clears throat> excuse me, their stomach is so small. So that's why they're feeding so much and so frequently because their tummy is small, they're digesting it quickly, um, and they need more after you know about one, two hours, sometimes every 10 minutes, sometimes every 30 minutes. Um, it's just gonna depend on their feedings. And um, feeding on demand is really important with breastfeeding. Um, you don't want to watch a clock when you're breastfeeding because the baby knows their needs better than a clock. Okay, and then how often feeding should occur when it comes to breastfeeding? Um, babies should feed like blueberries, the one below, which is more on demand. Lots of feedings. Some are small, some are bigger, some are close together, some are further apart. <clears throat> It's not going to be every two, three hours um, with typical, like we see with typical formula feeding, it is going to be on demand. Should be a minimum of 10 times in 24 hours in the beginning. Um, like I said before, you really should aim for around 10 just to uh, make sure you're, you're supporting your supply. Um, the more, the better usually in the beginning. Feeding by the clock every three hours is associated with early weaning, meaning earliest termination of breastfeeding. So. Again, try not to watch the clock and watch your baby instead. <clears throat> watch for hunger cues from the baby. This can be signs of when you should be latching and feeding the baby. Um, some of these cues are eyes moving beneath the eyelids. That's a great time to latch the baby. It's when they're in that active sleep. So the baby's eyes will be closed and you'll see their eyes moving back and forth. That's a great time to try to feed the baby um, and practice breastfeeding. <clears throat> Eyes fluttering before they open, so baby just starts to wake up. It's a great time to watch the baby. Um, they're making mouth movements, looking for you, turning their mouth. Great time to, to watch the baby. They're getting a little restless. Hands are coming towards their mouth. They're turning their head side to side, looking for mom. Whimpering, a little bit of squeaking. All good signs the baby is ready to feed. And crying is actually a late feeding sign. Really trying to catch one of these earlier feeding cues is going to be. Um, more beneficial for the baby and also more beneficial for you and uh, to allow you to latch the baby easier than if the baby is sitting there crying. <laughs> so every baby is going to be different. Some mothers have a larger storage capacity, which allows baby to get a lot of milk in one feeding. Hence, they might have longer times between feedings, um, but some will not have that. So they'll have, you know, smaller feedings more frequently. <clears throat> Again, exclusively breastfed infants on average feed eight times in 24 hours, but this can vary pretty greatly between four and 13 sessions per day. So again, just depends on mother's storage capacity and the baby's you know, practice with feeding and how well they are at nursing. Some babies nurse quickly and efficiently, sometimes less than five minutes they can get all they need, and others enjoy longer feedings. Many babies who nurse often in the first month nurse less often as they get older because they get more efficient and the mother's milk supply increases to meet their needs. Um, so sometimes in the beginning, you can have a 15, 20 minute feed and then by the baby's three months, they could be doing these five minute feeds if they're really efficient at it. 
So supporting supply, um, especially, especially in the beginning, nursing frequently. We'll be watching for those early signs of hunger and latching the baby as much as you can. Supply I will regulate around three to six weeks, but don't let this worry you. Um, this is very normal for this to happen. Spend lots of time skin to skin. Again, holding the baby against your skin, really good. If you're away from the baby, make sure you're pumping in place of those feedings. If you are away from the baby, you know, all day, um, for any reason, you want to be pumping about 8 to 10 times in 24 hours, just like you would feeding the baby. And just so you know, milk supply can be adversely affected by certain things, and this includes alcohol, cigarettes, over-the-counter cold remedies, antihistamine like Zyrtec, decongestants, and the hormone-based contraceptives. Make sure you check with your healthcare provider before taking these medications, or if you are taking them and notice a supply decrease in your milk supply, um, consider stop taking them as well. So hand expression, um, the first few days of life are crucial and will determine the amount of milk you make throughout the entire breastfeeding birth journey. After the baby breastfeeds, you can hand express the remaining colostrum, which is that first milk that the baby that you make with your with breastfeeding, and actually spoon feed it to the baby if you feel like the baby did not feed well. Um, so we recommend spoon feeding over the bottle feeding because usually it's a very, very tiny amount that colostrum, as you can see in this picture here. So putting that in the bottle is, you know, usually not necessary. The baby does a really good job about using a spoon, like you see in this picture. Um, avoiding bottles and pacifiers, again, can help um, support your breastfeeding bowls and be able to breastfeed um, and latch the baby better. So using a spoon like this is actually going to be better for the breastfeeding mom. Um, sometimes hand expression is easier and more efficient than the pump itself. It's a great skill to learn um, because all you need is your hand. Um, there's so many great videos out there. Uh, I'm not going to show you one today, um, but I will show, share some resources if you do want to go on and watch some videos on about how to hand express. I totally recommend learning how to do that. It's super easy. And again, you can do it in the hospital. You can do it when you're, you know, you're out. And you need to express your milk because you're, you know, you're feeling a little bit full. It's a great tool to know how to do. Okay, so I wanted to touch on how partners can support mom with that, with, during her breastfeeding journey, because it is important. Um, the partner can help with positioning and hold newborn during feeds um, with pumped milk. Um, the, uh, the partner can make the meals and get mom water or fluids. Uh, the partner can help with cleaning and cooking. Um, the partner can also help mom, you know, look at her latch and see if there's anything wrong with her latch, or maybe um, if mom should try a different position, the partner can be knowledgeable in it as well. You know, let mom know that she's loved and appreciated for her efforts, um, because it can be a lot, it, you know, especially in the beginning, feeding a baby and having a newborn is, is a, lot of, a lot of work. So letting mom know that she's doing great can really be helpful. Provide lots of love and care for the baby, um, and provide that skin to skin as well. Partners can totally do that. It is you know, the baby does enjoy that and it's good for the baby to have that. So skin to skin is another one that anyone can do with the, with the baby. Okay, a little bit about breastfeeding and nutrition. Um, so some breastfeeding moms need about 300 to 500 extra calories per day when they're breastfeeding. Because like I said before, you are burning a lot of calories. So you want to make sure that you're getting enough um, just to support overall health and healing after childbirth. Mother's diet should include a variety of different foods. And most, almost all foods are safe with breastfeeding. Um, some things you do want to avoid are going to be any kind of high mercury fish, like the king mackerel, swordfish, and tilefish we have down here. Just trying to stay away from those um, when you are breastfeeding because that mercury can go through your breast milk. Um, and you also want to eat a diet rich in protein, healthy fats, iron, vitamin D, and calcium. Um, you know, I hear a lot of moms say, you know, they've had to cut out broccoli or Brussels sprouts or or beans, or some of those gassy foods. And a lot of times that isn't the case. Um, so, you know, the babies with breast milk, they digest it really well. If they're pooping a lot, that's just normal. Um, or if they're having a little bit of gas, usually pretty normal. So um, I wouldn't cut anything out unless you are noticing a huge issue. Um, every mom and baby pair is gonna be very individualized. It's gonna be very different for each pair. So um, definitely eliminating food before you even try anything is, is definitely not recommended. And then breastfeeding and supplements. Um, some products may be recommended by family and friends to help increase your milk. These can include things like herbs, 
lactation teas, like the one you see here, that mother's milk I see a lot, medications, and even those lactation cookies. But before you try taking any kind of supplement to try and help, always consult your doctors first. Um, you want to make sure that what you're taking is safe while you're breastfeeding. Always best to work with a breastfeeding professional to figure out the root cause of um, mother's concern with her low milk supply. Um, so sometimes, or most of the times, it's an issue with um, maybe a poor latch. The mom's not latching the baby on properly, so the baby's not able to get that milk efficiently. Um, that's when we see most often. Um, or a lot of times it's lack of education on what their supply should look like. Maybe the baby is around three to six weeks and their supply is regulated and mom is concerned about that. I hear that a lot. Um, so just again, remember, you know, baby gets better at breastfeeding. They're going to be more efficient as they get older. Doesn't mean that they're not getting enough. Um, sometimes it could be not feeding enough. So maybe the mom's only feeding five to six times in 24 hours. Um, that could be increased and that could fix that, that supply as well. So again, always trying to consult your doctor and your breastfeeding professional um, before going to something like herbs or lactation teas or medications or anything like that. Just want to discuss about a few that are pretty popular. Fenugreek is one of the most popular ones for supplementing milk supply. Unfortunately, there's little to no evidence that it actually helps um, and is definitely contraindicated with pregnancy. So don't take when you're pregnant. We also have stuff alfalfa, milk thistle, fennel, black seed, shatava root, also little to no evidence to support their use, unfortunately. We do have a prescription medication that is sometimes prescribed to increase prolactin called Reglin. So prolactin is a milk making hormone. Um, one of the side effects though of this medication is depression. So just be aware of that. And again, you wanna be working with a healthcare provider if this is recommended to you. Bottom line, um, moms do not need supplements to initiate breastfeeding, to build a supply and maintain their milk supply. Um, if they're getting the proper education and support from their healthcare provider and their breastfeeding team. Some general information about nutrition and postpartum. So um, really the same general healthy diet should be followed after postpartum. You wanna be including whole foods, lots of fruits, vegetables, whole grains, healthy fats, protein rich foods. Um, limiting highly processed foods, high sugar foods, high saturated fats, pretty general diet that we talk about here on these classes. If you, um, you should be taking a prenatal and you want to continue taking this prenatal, especially with breastfeeding. Um, pay close attention to certain nutrients that are important to um, help you recover after childbirth. Protein is really important. It helps recover um, again after childbirth. So, you know, meats, we meat, chicken, fish, turkey, lean red meats, um, game meats, all really good eggs, dairy, things like that should be included every day with your, with your meals. Um, iron's another important nutrient, especially if you lost a lot of blood with, with uh, childbirth. Um, it is in your prenatal vitamin, but um, and a lot of times some moms take it separately as a supplemented, um, a supplementation. Um, that should be discussed with your doctor first before doing that. Um, but you can get iron from um, meat sources. So protein and iron kind of go together a lot of the times. Um, you can also get um, iron from uh, plant sources as well. And then calcium is another great food that is uh, a nutrient that's needed postpartum as well. So mostly your dairy foods, also beans, um, some leafy greens as well for calcium. And moms lose about 4.5 pounds of baby weight about each month. This is an average that moms lose and a healthy amount of weight that moms lose after giving birth. Um, you really want to avoid any kind of crash dieting and very low calories postpartum because you are recovering. Childbirth is a big is a big thing. Um, so she get a C-section. That's a surgery. You you need to be eating enough food and having the proper nutrition to help you recover. Um, so really try not to do any kind of crash diets or any dieting in general. Um, just eating lots of whole foods and um, things like that can help with that that slow weight loss that you want to want to achieve while you're when you, after you give birth. Um, so really trying to stay above at least 1800 calories, if not 2000 calories a day, and try not to drop under that when you're, especially when you're breastfeeding. <clears throat> and then for exercise, you wanna be get, you wanna get the clear from your doctor. They usually say it's okay four to six weeks postpartum. A lot of times they, you know, they recommend some light walking even before that. So 
Um, obviously exercise can help with weight loss and just general health overall. So discuss that with your doctor before um, doing any type of uh, exercise. <laughs> okay, so for breastfeeding, um, when, when should you ask for help? These are all good signs that you wanna seek out some support from somebody else, your healthcare provider, or your lactation specialist, um, cause you wanna figure out what's going on and you can, um, what you should do going forward. So if baby has trouble latching and does not feed well, if you continue trying to latch and you notice those signs aren't there, um, you say you don't see the baby swallowing or something else, um, that's a sign that you wanna reach out to somebody. If the baby's urine is dark and scanty or the baby's poop has not changed to yellow by day five, if it's still that black or that um, green poops, we definitely wanna be reaching out to the doctor by day five. Um, if the baby has not regained their birth weight by two weeks. Um, so babies generally lose between seven to 10% of their body weight within those first seven to 10 days. And that is completely normal. Um, but by the time they are two weeks, they should be back to their birth weight. Um, that is a good sign that baby is getting enough from mom. Baby is very sleepy or difficult to rouse constantly you feel like you have a super sleepy baby and it's hard to get the baby to wake up and feed, um, that should be a sign to ask for help. If you have not noticed that your production has increased by day five, you want to reach out to somebody as well. Um, usually by day five, you are, your breasts are feeling pretty full at that point, and that's a great sign that your milk supply is um, coming in. If you have ongoing pain when you're watching the baby or discomfort, um, breasts are painful with hard, tender, or red areas, your nipples are really cracked. Um, all signs that you need to help. Um, again, cracked or sore nipples that have not healed in three to five days. Um, here is some resources. So who should you reach out to? Um, so I also work for WIC. It's Women, Infants, and Children. You've heard me talk about this program before. Uh, we staff lactation specialists, IBCLCs, and CLCs, and peer counselors at WIC, and all of our clients get access to them for free. So they get access to them in person, over the phone, um, virtually. We offer lots of support uh, when you are a WIC client. If you are interested in seeing if you qualify for the WIC program, we have the number down there, 305-676-3933. I highly recommend you reach out. Um, you know, a lot of times people think about WIC and feel like, you know, all we do is formula, um, but we do so much with breastfeeding and we have such a great staff for breastfeeding. And I would highly recommend anyone to reach out to us if for some reason, um, you know, you call and you don't qualify, um, it is income based. Uh, we do offer monthly breastfeeding classes and that is free for the entire community. You do not have to be a WIC client to attend those classes. Um, they are taught by a CLC and you get a lot of great resources. It's an hour long class. We host them in Key Largo, Marathon and Key West. So again, you can reach out to that number um, that 3933 number, and we can tell you all about the classes and when the next class is and get you signed up for that. We encourage, you know, anyone to come to the classes. We encourage partners to come, family members, anyone you want to bring is welcome to come to the class. <clears throat> There's also lots of um, reputable websites that have great videos. One of our favorites is the Global Health Media. Um, they have a great hand expression video that I talked about earlier, which is a great thing to know how to do. Um, they have lots of videos on the global health media and they're in over like 70 languages. Um, so definitely check out that website. Um, and also friends that I've have are currently breastfeeding great resources as well. Um, and then we also have another program called healthy start that offer breastfeeding support. They offer, um, pumps to moms, um, lots of good resources as well. Um, that number is on below the 3841 number. So. Um, if you are expecting, or um, I would definitely reach out to these two programs and see what you qualify for so we can get you set up and you can have some resources when it comes to breastfeeding support. And then I just wanted to go over some of the breastfeeding myths that I hear a lot. Um, <clears throat> this is a big one, you know, formula fed babies sleep longer than breastfeeding babies. This is not true. Um, research shows that feeding formula makes no difference in night waking. As baby gets older, they tend to wake up less often and tend to need feeding less often. That's just a general um, thing that happens. Breastfeeding mothers and their partners actually get more sleep and better sleep than mothers who formula feed. This is a study that they did when they compared breastfeeding infants to formula feeding infants. 
um, and those breastfed infants and their partners got about 45 minutes more per night when it came to sleep and more deep sleep, which is really good for that recovery. So that's really interesting. So that is false. Um, putting cereal in the baby's bottle can help them sleep. Uh, also false. I do see this recommended a lot. Um, starting a baby on cereal early will make no difference in their night sleeping pattern. And it actually increases their risk for allergies later in life, increases overfeeding because it adds extra calories, which can lead to excess weight gain for the baby, and also increases their risk of choking. And they're just not able to, do, to process that food being so little. Um, and we really recommend waiting till six months to provide any type of food, um, especially cereal. And that cereal should not be put in the bottle. It should be provided by the spoon only. <laughs> And the next one is going to be, I feel like my breasts are not as full as they were in the beginning. Is my supply going down? Again, we see that regulation of the breast milk by four to six weeks, um, and that is very normal. So this is probably not a sign that your breast milk supply is going down. If you have been nursing eight to 12 times a day and baby is producing lots of wet diapers, is gaining weight and meeting developmental milestones, everything should be fine. This is common because your body has figured out how much milk is the right amount to make for now. So you're less likely to feel really full when you did in the beginning. You're just getting better at breastfeeding. And here's a bunch of resources that I got a lot of the information from. Again, um, the world, the, uh, sorry, the global health media was a great one. The Leche League has been around for a long time. They have great handouts and information. Healthychildren.org, a lot of great stuff as well. Um, so you can check out that. Obviously, CDC has a lot of stuff on breastfeeding um, that can be really helpful. Um, Medela is one of the uh, breast pump companies, and they have a lot of great free resources on their website as well. Um, they do a lot of trainings as well for any health professionals who want to learn more about breastfeeding as well. We do a lot of those every month. Okay. Any questions about breastfeeding? Or postpartum nutrition. Well, I think this was absolutely a fantastic presentation, um, just for new moms or siblings of of potential new moms that they can share this information with, or moms that have had babies and then had a little bit of a break before they had their next one and they needed a little refresher course. So I think it was all fantastic information, and we look forward to the next class which is going to be on January 22nd at 1 p.m. And you're going to discuss a little bit more about infant nutrition. Tell us a little bit more about what you'll discuss there. Yep. So we're going to continue on with our um, child's uh, nutrition series, and we're going to be talking about infant nutrition. So we just talked a lot about breastfeeding. Obviously, that's part of infant nutrition, but we're going to talk about starting foods around six months and what that looks like for the baby. Um, so I'm excited to talk to you guys more about that and hope you join in. That sounds great. Well, happy, well, happy holidays to you, Hannah, and to all of our viewers. And we look forward to a healthy and happy 2022. Yes. Looking forward to it. Happy holidays, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.